Good to see you. Oh, thank you. It's good. It's been a, seems like it's been a while, but then you tell me it's not been a while. And I, but we, that'll just give you an idea of the way things are going in the, uh, in life post, hopefully, you know, uh, trending toward post COVID. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We try to be a minimum of quarterly you and I, and this is actually, I believe number eight for us. Hmm. Yes, yes, this is number eight for us. So that's really exciting. Eight is a good luck, quote unquote, number in Chinese. So this will be our lucky episode. <laughs> well, my birthday's in the eighth month. So win win. Win win. <laughs> speaking of win and speaking of, you know, com competitions and everything, I'm so excited to be reading your wandering weights and keeping up with not just the Merlin stuff, which is what you and I always go over, but of course, all the really cool different things you've been doing, especially through COVID. But Tell me about the competitions and kind of what motivated you to start that again and um, why. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I had uh, I had a total hip replacement December eighteenth, uh, two thousand and ugh, God, I got so cocky. I think nineteen. Okay, it was right before COVID hit, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things I was going to try to do uh, was come out of it was eighteen because the the wedding was in nineteen. Sorry. Uh, the reason I got it done then was so I would be okay at my daughter's wedding. So I could dance and throw cabers, uh, at our family for the rehearsal dinner, uh, or the wedding itself. We have a Highland games as part of the, as part oh, of the, fun. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so I wanted to make sure I was able to flip, turn the caber. Uh, I make the joke that, you know, you can't really get married until the father of the bride turns the caber. Uh, I don't know how many fathers of the bride turn capers, but yeah, it's, it's funny to say that out loud. And for our listeners who don't know anything about the Highland Games, explain exactly what that is. Oh, the Highland Games. Uh, well, it used to be a lot of fun, but now I call them track meets and kilts. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I started doing it in 84. Um, it, you probably would recognize like the stone put from Braveheart, the Braemar, that's where your feet don't move. It's a, so the stone puts 17 pound rock. The Braemar is about a 27 pound rock. And then there's uh, the heavy hammers, the hammers, which one's 16, one's 22. And they're stiff. They, they don't have any wire. They're, they're either bamboo or nowadays PVC. Uh, so 16 and 22 pound. And then there's the, the light weight for distance, which is 28 and the heavy weight, which is 56. Mm -hmm. And those look more discusy. And then there's the caber, which is the big telephone pole that we flip. Mm -hmm. and then really in the games I run there's always a farmer walk because uh, okay <laughs> uh, of course because you're Dan yeah. John <laughs> well no actually and I think it's much more traditional yeah I'm not a big fan of the heights events I think those are okay. a little bit uh, more recent so I don't I like I like the horizontal events and the farmer walk okay um, and so the caber is... if you type in Dan John caber on YouTube you'll see me winning the Pleasanton games and then if you go to my, uh, I think in Coach Dan John on Instagram, I think it's me flipping it at my daughter's wedding. At the wedding. Uh, I love yeah. it. So at the wedding, of course, there's, yeah. there's your version of the games. I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So that's always fun. Um, but uh, with after that, I was thinking, oh, this feels pretty good. I'll get back in the discus throwing. And uh, last weekend, uh, the weekend before, I guess, I went down to Tempe to Arete throws nations two day camp, but I learned a ton. It was just uh, really great instruction. Last weekend I had an Olympic lifting meet and I did really well. And we'll talk about that more. And then this, uh, in fact, uh, uh, oh yeah, it is tomorrow. Tomorrow I fly out to New York for a kettlebell certification. So, okay. um, so uh, shot discus, Olympic lift kettlebells, three weekends. Uh, the number of people on the planet Earth who could probably pull that off is less than you think. Uh, <laughs> For sure. I am uh, not one of them. But one of the things I love from your newsletter is just sign up, send the check, show up, stick to the plan, adjust and repeat. And I just love the simplicity of that, but how yeah. hard that is for people. Well, and that's, you know, it's weird. It, you, I like how you said that because that's exactly what I do. Uh, probably this afternoon, I'm going to go online. And in fact, I've got already got, I already have the tabs open. I just didn't, as you saw, I was a uh, gentle listener when, uh, when we, we first started today, I just, I just opened the thing to make sure I wouldn't, uh, I was on Mimi caught me going through about, oh, uh, Larry Draper, the great, my great publisher 
sent me out a whole box of books, uh, historical weightlifting books. So all of a sudden she popped on and I was in the middle of uh, uh, opening up all these wonderful books and stuff. So uh, it is just, uh, uh, I, I, I was going to, and, and Mimi will tell me, I tell you, I was a little, it was a little, there was a few minutes of confusion as I was looking at all these books. I can't wait to read. And then there's Mimi and then there's signing up for a, a weightlifting meet in November. So yeah, that's what I do about uh, the second I find out there's something I want to go to. I uh, go online, I click the buttons, I give, put my credit card information in, I book the hotel room uh, for this meet in Reno, probably just as easy for me to drive to versus fly. Reno is not a good place to fly to from where I'm at. Mm. Uh, it's just not, I mean, yeah. you know, it's just not a, a good location. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll hop in the car November 3rd or 4th, whatever the hell it is, and drive out, spend the night or two, and then uh, get in the car and be sore as hell driving home. <laughs> and the idea is, you know, you, you sign up, you send the money in, uh, you get the hotel room, and then you make an X on a calendar when I got to start thinking about it. And for me, the best way to emotionally prepare for something is the 12 week process of preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like this last minute stuff in anything in life. Right. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, things happen sometimes, sometimes, you know, you, you don't, things aren't always perfect. You know, I, oh, that was one of my complaints about stupid people during the beginning of COVID. Um, the stupid people were allowed to have opinions and it's like, well, like that one idiot, uh, the white house woman who said, well, we should have had known what was coming. This is COVID-19. There's already been 18 of them. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's 19 because it's 2019 you and <laughs> well why if these scientists are so smart why don't they know this well they didn't know anything they were doing their best to just keep you alive you idiot yeah sometimes yeah. you know like uh, just in front of my house on the way home from lunch a uh, pedestrian got hit by a car on oh. a perfect day i mean absolutely perfect day i pulled over and i knew the murray policeman and we talked just for a second about just how stupid people can be on a perfect 90 degree day here in Utah with miles of visibility. Uh, someone tried to speed through uh, uh, a red light mm -hmm. and took out, a, took out a pedestrian. Right. And, you know, uh, what, and for me, I don't want to speed through red lights because I want to show up early. <laughs> exactly. You know, if, if, if it takes me 20 minutes to get somewhere, I give it a half an hour. So mm -hmm. I don't speed through and hit a pedestrian. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's awfully you. responsible of you, Dan. Yeah, what, am I thinking? <laughs> what are you thinking? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I know it, it, you know, off air, it was, it was actually a lot of fun catching you in your, in your not ready for the podcast moment, because I got to see a little day in the life behind the scenes. It was, it was, it was actually kind of fun to be able to talk to you off air and, yeah. and, and see all of your books and, and, and everything and catch up with you. And we were talking and it's just, it's been such a, it's, been such a crazy time and you and I have spoken throughout this pandemic and every time we speak there's a new thing uh off air we were saying yeah and the new thing um that happens to have come up is is of course all the elderly and Asian American community being attacked over the last year and, and attacked. It's, yes yeah and it's just been insane right and and you asked what I was up to and I said well I'm trying to help with the Asian American history here and yeah Florida's kind of crazy. And, and we, we were kind of going on something that I think would be great for listeners to get your coping mechanisms, because we've all in some way had to grieve a loss of something, whether yeah. we did lose someone through COVID, uh, which, you know, unfortunately all of us yeah. maybe have, or at least know somebody who has, uh, there's been loss of jobs. There's been loss of opportunity. Like you mentioned, there's been just a lot of loss. And, and I think we forget that we are allowed to grieve and that we need to in order to kind of move forward and and uh, what what would you give in terms of coping mechanisms or your advice on dealing sure. with grief and loss because i know this is something that you're you know very good at helping others yeah, i'm actually with. i'm actually certified, certified. exactly <laughs> uh you know the first thing i would always tell people and, it, and it's a hard it's it's a very strange thing I, I, elizabeth kubler what Ross work became very popular and famous. In fact, in all that jazz, the the, the movie directed by Bob Fosse, they make mm -hmm. I won't say they make fun of it, but they a lot of people. That's when I mean that's when the comedian went through it piece after piece, and the and the the the, the main character was dying and going through the 
But that is not what most people do when they go through any kind of grief. Uh, in fact, the best, the best way I've ever heard it described as grief is like a roller coaster. There's going to be ups and downs. And there's really no way when it comes to grieving that you're going to be able to say, okay, I'm going to grieve, you know, Saturday. Well, you know, when I was first going through these grief therapy classes, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that just broke my heart, but the woman who had taught the course, uh, she lost a child to SIDS. I don't know what SIDS death is, say, say it's six months. Well, and her and her husband uh, ate, were able to make their marriage work after that, which is, by the way, uh, can be a really difficult thing. And she became involved in grief therapy when she was driving her car one day and she saw a school bus and she started sobbing uncontrollably and couldn't stop sobbing. Her husband came home from work. They both worked, but they, they, they just took a time out. Well, it turned out that this would have been the fall that their child would have started school. Mm. Nowhere in her conscious brain did she do the math, but her whole conscious brain had done the math, obviously. Yeah. And so sometimes when it comes to coping with grief, is you just have to accept the fact that um, there's no rhyme and reason to how your heart is going to feel one day. Um, you know, as you know, I've mentioned before, and, and, and many things, I have issues with concussions. I took a discus in the head when I was in college, and I lost about, basically about six months, I have a, a period where I don't really remember anything. Um, I have I have some sparks of memory, but I don't really have clear memories at all. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, you, one of the things about uh, massive concussions, very big concussions, is that you tend to get, to, I call them the dark nights of the soul. By, by the way, by labeling it the dark night of the soul versus seasonal affective disorder or... Uh, <laughs> depression of you know uh you know occasional depression by calling it a formal name it is the dark night of the soul actually helps me but what helps me the most is this i feel it coming on i can feel this depression coming on i know it's coming and then i say that's not you danny this is the dark night of the soul it is, was caused by getting hit in the head with a discus from multiple collisions in american football and from just, you know, odds and ends playing, mm -hmm. you know, playing sports. By labeling it this, I breathe out and I don't have the impact. Sometimes when you're doing something like, for example, if you lost your job, a loved one or something like that, and all of a sudden you, you walk into the kitchen and you forgot what the hell you went into the kitchen for. Don't say I'm losing my mind. Just say, you know, it's been a I've had a rough year and a half and it's funny giving yourself that permission. And in this case, we'll say grieve. Okay. We'll say giving yourself permission to grieve, giving yourself permission not to be perfect. I guess that's it right there. You know, um, like many people, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm going through my own issues, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, upstairs, I've got a grandson who, almost didn't make it because of uh, an issue, but he's doing fine now and he's growing every single inch. Well, on top of that issue, there was another issue this spring. I'm not going to talk about it here, but, um, and sometimes when I'm doing something and like, well, actually Mimi talking with you when I was kind of, I got, I let myself get a little flustered and flabbergasted when you pinged on. I, I just, and I'm like, as I look back on just six or seven or eight minutes ago, I go, you know, Danny, it's okay to be early for a podcast. It's okay to be put books back on their shelves. It's okay for Mimi to wait a few minutes while you, you set up. It's okay. And it's weird because here I am giving all this sage advice, but at the same time, I too am walking <laughs> I'm walking through the shadow of death, uh, uh, like like so many others, and and actually, um, 
that was my third point, and I've already hinted towards it. Um, you know, Psalm 23, you know, you do not sprint through the shadow of death. You, you do not, uh, <laughs> you do not rollerblade through it. You do not, you know, jet ski through it. You walk. And one of the, one of the things that has helped me most in my grief therapy, um, I don't want to get too specific about religion or sacred scripture or anything, but in Luke 24, uh, there's, it's a seven mile walk in, in the Psalm, you walk through the, uh, through the Valley of death. And one of the things I found very reassuring and comforting when I do do any kind of grief work or any kind of work where, you know, if you're dealing with a parent with Alzheimer's or something like that, it's the idea that any, any, any of life's challenges, let's go for a walk you know, uh, and, or let's go get a cup of coffee. Let's have a glass of wine. It's not here. Here's, here are the seven things you need to know. Mm -hmm. No, let's just sit down. If you ever join an anonymous program of any kind, especially if it's, it's for a spouse or a child, like, um, um, one of the things that when you first go to uh, any kind of program, you want the other participants to give you a checklist. Here are the five things to do to stop your son from doing heroin. Here are the six things to do to get your spouse off of whatever. Mm -hmm. And the first lesson you learn is you can't do anything. But the rest of us here are with you tonight. Here's my phone number and I'll be with you. You're going through the grief. You lost your father, your mother, your your, your child. I, I can't... <laughs> I can't cure it, you know, I can't, mm -hmm. I didn't cause it, I can't control it, I can't cure it, but I can be here for you. And that is what, that to me is, I just summarize a lot of grief therapy courses, but that to me is the best. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, be, you know, be there, be there. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And it, it is kind of interesting what you were saying in the beginning, how, you just don't know what's going to trigger you as well. And it's, and it's to remind ourselves that, oh, what it is okay. Just because this happened six months ago or a year ago, it's not like things you, you say you should be over this by now, or this shouldn't affect you anymore because that's just not the way it works. Right. It's, 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 <laughs> we, I mean, if it were that methodical, <laughs> it would be a lot different, but can, can yeah. I swear on your podcast. Of course. <laughs> so my brother Ray went to Vietnam uh, with that group called the Second Expeditionary Brigade. That was that group of Marines that went over and their orders said for the duration. Well, these guys were uh, totally overwhelmed uh, by uh, enemy forces. They did not have, they didn't have the support they, and, they, and my brother's group got really uh, decimated. So when he came home early in the Vietnam War, it's before all the anti-war stuff came out, I wouldn't say he, he was fine, but later he would talk about things like post-traumatic stress as he would call them, these guys fucking pussies, you know. And then two weeks before my father died, he lost his house in the Oakland fires, the famous Oakland fires. Oh. And when Ray visited his house, you could see he wasn't there. And he later said that all I had done with my memories of Vietnam is I just shuffled them off. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and what happened when he saw his home completely, the only thing that survives, by the way, is coffee mugs. Coffee mugs survive. Because mm -hmm. they're, nothing else survived. There was a shell of a motorcycle. There was a shell of cars. And everything else was gone. But the reason I bring up this is because even if you don't think you're going to grieve or have issues, you do. And this is, well, this is a basic part of grief therapy. Very often you'll go to a funeral and you'll see somebody who looks just like they're not even affected by it. That's the person I worry about the most. Mm -hmm. The person who throws themselves on the coffin and sobs miserably and makes a public display probably is going to be okay. Hmm. 
it's the person that just keeps checking the boxes and you know uh, that kind of thing. Uh, in my own case, losing my brother two years ago, uh, again, fires, fires haunt my family, in case you wonder. So my brother lived in paradise. And of course, uh, if you watch the movie, Gentle Listener, Rebuilding Paradise, um, it's on National Geographic and it's on Delta, by the way. Um, the funeral at the end is my brother, Phil, um, oh. which is, so it's been two years. And, uh, you know, and what makes me grieve the loss of my brother, Phil, um, comes and goes, it, it, it waves in and waves out. And it's interesting because the people at his funeral who were the most over the top are fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. You will grieve. And the truth is gentle listener, and this isn't good news. There is a grief process when you gra graduate from high school. There's a real grief process when your athletic career comes to an end, either with injury or with reality. <laughs> um, and when your kids, you know, every parent I know can't wait for the kids to get the hell out of the house. And then the day they're gone, you're like, uh, no. Yeah, you might take the room and refurbish it into an office, but I guarantee you'll never use that office. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, grief is, grief is a tough one. And for those of us, and, and all of us had had some share of grief, you know, there's the, all my local neighbors who have kids who graduate from high school in the last two years, you know, uh, there was no prom, there was no football season. There was yeah. no graduation, you know, <laughs> yeah, no graduation. Yeah. And, you know, uh, everybody's mad at the principal at the school. Cause we had this kind of graduation, not that kind. And it's like, what else can we do? Right. I mean, would you rather would you rather bury a faculty member or make it uncomfortable one day to have the faculty member wave at you from a car? It's mm -hmm. your call. Either way. You know, um, I think one of the things that's allowed me to get through some of the stuff better was growing up in a military family during uh, Vietnam. Uh, I posted a picture of my dad the other day uh, coming over his injuries from his war experience. Um, so one of the things you, you're you get used to uh, one of the things i i i learned to a coping medicine mechanism i learned as a child is yeah think <laughs> things can go bad real fast so enjoy enjoy your cheerios and toast for breakfast mm -hmm. you know enjoy you know enjoy these times together playing pen we used to call it penny any uh poker you know <laughs> enjoy playing yahtzee with each other you know because these this may not last. Right. Yeah. I think people are finally coming to that realization too. the, the time that we had pre even the, like, as you said earlier, hopefully going into post COVID time, it's still not really going to be exactly the same. There are things that will not ever be the same and we are forever changed as well. And I think it's been, it's been difficult for a lot of people and we're lucky here you know, where I'm at at the school, we have this connectivity, we've had something that has grounded us and has kept yeah. us together and has kept us working towards something and like refocusing, but it's definitely, we've seen, you know, the effects from all ages and it, it's affected everybody and it continues to and well, but I yeah. think uh, those, those are all well, really great things. To, one you know, of the things there. I'm hoping becomes just normal is working from home. Uh, it's interesting businesses that are insisting on everyone coming back to work according to my daughters anyway, it's all the boomer places, you know, the places. And by the way, I'm about as young as you can be to be a boomer. So <laughs> we're not going to be around much longer. And thank God for it. <laughs> the greatest generation in the history of America led to the most spoiled brat. And I'm part of it. Generation <laughs> America. Uh, yeah. Every, every time a, a, a poll comes out, my generation is the one that forgot. So what my generation did is the generation before us put all the ladders down to make it easier for us to climb up. Mm -hmm. My generation pulled all the ladders back up. <laughs> and this Great is analogy. Like, yeah, well, it is. I mean, just, yeah. we're a horrible group. Uh, they're the, the only uh, demographic against June Juneteenth yes. as a holiday. Yes. My, my people. Boomers. <laughs> Why, why, wait a second. Why should we, what do we need that for? Yeah. God, we see. 
Um, I I hear you. I am in Florida where there is a very, a large population that have their own way of thinking that I vehemently disagree with. But uh, this is why it's important for each generation after to be able to get educated and speak out and make changes and, and fight for what they believe in, because if we're not doing it, it's, there's just so much looming. And, and like you said, hopefully, um, things change and in terms of with each generation comes new thinking and improvements, because that's kind of how science works, right? We, we, we go, Oh, this is the new information. So here's what we do. I know in exercise, you do that all the time. You're like, well, this is outdated information. We're not going to do it just because it's always been done this way. We're going to do it because now it's better. It's more efficient. There's less injuries. There's, you Uh know, it's, (laughs) you're very wise. Yeah. So well, this was a little depressing, <laughs> a little bit depressing, but I, the nice thing is I was as honest as can as I could ever be. I, 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 I don't know what your, the, what your listeners think, but I, I do think it's important that someone who is like me, who looks like me, who's at my age, who, who I mean, I've got blue eyes and I got, uh, I, I had blonde hair, but now it's whatever. <laughs> I am a hint of white. Now I'm Irish, you know, I'm not, you know, some of those others, but I think it's really important for people who are my age and the, the hue of my skin. And um, I, I sometimes feel like I am one of the few people who figured out that, yeah, things were a hell of a lot easier for me. Uh, just it, we, let's just ignore the skin color one because that seems to piss off more people. But the <laughs> fact that I was male, um, when I graduated from high school and junior college, there were male athletic scholarships. There were some female ones, but they weren't as easy. Now, truth be told, now it's all flipped, but and that's good. But I had more opportunities in life than mm-hmm. my sister did simply because of my gender. Yeah. I have to be able to say, and it if I don't, I have no in intellectual integrity and I should slap myself. I have had more opportunities because of the color of my skin and because of my gender. And that is a true fact. And it upsets people. I lose, I lose followers because I'll say things like that. I did a thing on Black Lives Matter a year ago. And I, I actually, I kept some of the comments because the people look so stupid. Uh, <laughs> but the ones that had F-bombs in them and stuff like that, I, right. I took out. Um, um, people who don't think that there's an advantage to being a white male in my lifetime, you're stupid. Now, whether this continues to be a white, I mean, my grandson, Leo, is going to call me one day and say, you don't know what it's like now. I'll just slap him across the face and shut up. He's going to be six foot eight. You know, he's going to be six foot eight, fast twitch monster with a great ac- education. Shut up. <laughs> well, well, thank you for that, actually. It, it, it is appreciated by especially someone like me, right? A member of the BIPOC community, Asian female, and- um, You're it's... Asian? <laughs> yes. Well, you just said so. I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's it's hard to have these conversations sometimes because people yeah. don't want to hear things. But I think a lot of times the ones that are doing the comments and the F-bombs on your thing and unfollowing you, and it's, a, I've tried to tell myself this anyway, so I don't lose hope for humanity, that it's just so much of- their insecurity and them not being able to cope with their feelings <laughs> and blaming other people than yeah. than their true hate for others. But it's been it's been a challenge for sure, especially seeing like my community specifically being attacked and the elderly being attacked. Like that has been very very like you know it was crazy for me. So Larice sent me out the, the two of Tommy Kono's books. And uh, Tommy Kono has been my hero since I first started lifting weights. He was in an internment camp and he was suffering from asthma and he turned to weightlifting and he became a multi-gold medalist at the Olympics, Mr. Universe, uh, the West German coach, the Mexican national coach. Never, I, well, and we just never, only now after his death are people coming to grips with the fact that Tommy Kono should be in that pantheon of of American sports heroes. If you were to have a list of the top 10 sport American sports heroes of all time, Tommy Cohn is on that list, mm. but he's not. Mm-hmm. Why isn't he on that list? Now he did not play a professional sport and I get that, but I mean, 
Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, won a gold medal and was a world champion. Yeah, and Tommy did that three times and five times. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's true. Uh, but here's the thing. And both of them, well, that would make a very cool list. <laughs> you know, um, who, who's, you know, whose sports qualifications are better than Tommy Kona? Hmm. You know, if you tell me Tiger Woods, I'll say, well, yeah, Jack Nicholson had more. If you tell me <laughs> Michael Jordan, I'll say Bill Russell had more, you know, hmm. <laughs> yeah. about the only person I could say uh, better than Tommy would be Bill Russell because of those, what, 14 NBA championships. <laughs> oh, wow. But even then, the Olympics <laughs> only happened four years, not every This is year. true. They don't have the same opportunity to, yeah, to have so, the numbers yeah, in. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's it's interesting because it's nice. Uh, the Sacramento public uh, radio station, and I had it on my wandering weights. Mm-hmm. I've been posting those. So if you want to go back an issue or two and share those Tommy Kono yes, uh, I videos, will. that might be worth your time. But here I am, little Irish Catholic boy, Danny John, you know, saying that, you know, Tommy Kono is the person we should be talking first and foremost with. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but it is nice that Tommy is finally getting his due. And guys like me have been wondering why hasn't he been getting his due since, <laughs> you know, I don't know, 60, 1964. <laughs> well, kudos to you for that. Yeah. And now, of course, I can't talk to you without talking about Sword in the Stone, but I, I emailed you and said, I kind of shed a little tear when I read your final, uh, you know, Wandering Weights where you're like, well, then there you go, the Sword in the Stone. And you've been sharing passages for such a long time, which is actually what four years, what started me to reach out to you about this and, and go on this journey with you myself. So luckily we're still on the journey, but yeah, I can't believe that you came. So let's do this. <laughs> Something I do have to say, I am disappointed with the last six months of my work. So one of my thoughts is, is to go back and redo the last few chapters. I wouldn't say I was tired. I had a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> I am not as thrilled with the last five or six chapters as I should have been. And mm-hmm. one of the things I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and redo a few of them. I see. Is this you not wanting to let go of Sword and Stone though? <laughs> Never let go. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah, some, somebody asked me, this, goes, what are you going to do this with another book? And it's like, no. <laughs> Uh, gentle listener how many of you would work tirelessly for four years for absolutely no income at all and and no and no one read i think you and i Mimi, are the only two uh, actually that's not true i was shocked at how many people uh would send in over the years yes um i i probably i don't know what i can do about with the copyrights i know that it's uh the edition i use is not an american copyright but Mm -hmm. um yeah, you know what? I'm thinking about re redoing a, a number of those last ones. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have a Do you have a copy of it? The whole thing. I have half from when you were working, so yeah, I don't have the whole thing. You can update it now. Um, and it's funny because I, when I was reading and and every time I prep for you for this podcast, I feel like I'm I'm in my like I'm some sort of like upper level grad student uh, sword in the stone study because like oh man i gotta i gotta read the book i go through my notes i gotta do my highlights i'm gonna be talking to dan i feel like i'm, I'm getting ready for a quiz or something and then when i would have your notes and then read what you wrote i would feel so affirmed if like we were thinking the same thing but then sure. i didn't want to read it because then i felt like i was cheating <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny I, this is like yeah, I've, it's been a long time since i've been doing academic studies so <laughs> so um as you, what you're going to see, and it just posted up, I just sent you the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So happy Got birth- it. what's your birthday, Mimi? January 30th. Every year? Every year. <laughs> Every year. All right. Let's get started on the All right. Sword so the Sword in the Stone. All right. We left off after Madame Mim. So we, yeah. we were able to wrap that up, which was a lot of fun in our last discussion. And the next discussion takes us into chapter seven, which is tilting and horsemanship. And um, <laughs> and then, of course, it takes us into Sir uh, uh, King Pellinore and Sir Grum. 
what's his name? Grummer Grummerson. Grum yes. Grummerson. Yes. And, and that, that's always a lot of fun. But so in chapter seven, we start off with that education, which, which in the beginning, they start off saying tilting and horsemanship had two afternoons a week because they were easily the most important branches of a gentleman's education in those days. And I, I find that hilarious, of course, because that's all the, the physicality that Merlin is trying to say, no, these are the important things. But then in those days, it's, it's kind of backwards. Right. Well, the first thing is you have to always remember when you come up to these specific, so any of the non-animal chapters, the transfiguration mm -hmm. chapters, you have to go back to the very first paragraph in the book. You always have to go back to, and I use the, uh, the Dennis. Oh, by the way, and I have Dennis Nolan. I'm going to buy some more Dennis Nolan artwork. Okay. But uh, when you go back to the very first chapter, it's when it says on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it was court hand and sumale logicalis, while the rest of the week, it was organon, repetition, astrology. The governance, okay, the governance always wrapped, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in the afternoons, the program was Monday and Fridays, tilting and horsemanship, Tuesday, hawking, which will be, which will the come next, up the birds. in several yes, coming the up. next chapter, mm -hmm. Wednesday, fencing, which shows up more so in the end, uh, Thursday, archery, but remember they're, sure they're playing poppy yes. day, mm -hmm. and Saturdays, the theory of chivalry <laughs> with the proper measure to be blown at all occasions terminology and stuff like that but if you remember when we get to uh mr twighty and the boar hunt that's when we'll meet uh, pelinor again mm -hmm. and it's because he he forgot the uh, etiquette and the boar hunt ah right, with right, the right. humans and all that yeah <laughs> and so so basically the next part is the craze for games was the ruination of true scholarship so i feel like this is like Merlin kind of always saying, this is why I'm here because I need to bring balance to Wart's education or actually education, educate Wart because he feels like he's basically not getting the education that he needs. And um, do you think that, oh, with this part said, nobody got scholarships like they used to do when he was a boy and all the public schools have been forced to lower their standards. I just think this is again, white kind of just jabbing and, <laughs> and taking us. It's interesting how he can take us out of the story but stay in the story it because he's yeah. always like making us aware that yeah i'm i'm writing this <laughs> when, when people talk about if this is historical or not i always look at him like how stupid are you <laughs> even yeah uh um one of the things that you might not is there's references in this chapter to the next book um uh, uh, which in the wind the wind uh, yeah yeah um one of the things that's going to happen when Arthur first has to deal with the, the barons who are rebelling is that the barons see fighting as a sport. So they're, they're going to go through and kill all the unarmed people. And Arthur and Merlin come with a plan to kill the barons. And it's considered very unsporty mm. to actually bring war to the wealthy class. <laughs> and what's well, the wealthy class don't like that. Well, what's interesting is it, it, you remember white is a product of World War I. Mm. And that was one of the big knocks on England is England still had uh, class warfare issues mm -hmm. in throughout. Like the elitist. Sir, yeah, Sir Douglas Haig once said that the machine gun is a much overrated weapon. And he felt that if the, the British soldier was braver, they could run through it. Oh. Well, you know, they just, <laughs> and of course, uh, this would probably not go over well, but you know they would send the Irish battalions in just to get the German gunners, uh, they, they, you know, their, their barrels hot, too mm -hmm. hot to fire. So there, that was still an issue. And, and I, as I understand it, classism still existed somewhat in World War II, uh, and I'm sure it's still that way too. I remember, um, you know, I, I know that with the uh, princess dies kids and mm -hmm. andrew and those guys they still you know they they get a whole bunch of award you know honors for that wouldn't be bestowed on a normal uh, you know helicopter pilot 
you know. Yeah, it's interesting because we're all so fascinated by the royal family. And even though we're all evolved and know that elitist and classism is not beneficial for, for society, but at the same time, it I fully admit it's hard to not kind of get sucked into watching the drama and yeah. and kind of just it's like another world, right? And just kind of it's unbelievable that it wasn't too long ago that that country was ruled by a monarch and that it was just oh still technically still is but, right you know, it's, and and you would know as well as anybody about the disney princess thing i mean it is <laughs> it is a and and the thing is you have to kind of sit back and go i have no issues with little girls um uh, doing that i have the same way i have no issues when i was young we were the three musketeers and we beat the hell out of each other uh with anything that protrude it would could be the my favorite one was the you know that cardboard roll yes from the the gift Chris, wrap gift wrapping absolutely we, i use that as well <laughs> we would just beat the living hell out of each other with that you know um our we had these uh long uh, you could rip them up they were easter lily things uh. we beat each other senseless with those things i got no issues with that but I guess I guess it becomes an issue for me, you know, when you see someone who, uh, you know, they they t they they still are doing that, you know. Ah, I don't have any issues with that. Either. <laughs> Do whatever you want, folks. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Well, it's funny because we always talk about this book and and everybody hears Merlin or Sword in the Stone and they kind of think of it as this like Arthurian tale of Camelot and, and all this stuff. And they and and you and I constantly talk about it as a book about education, yes. and basically how heavily seated in education it is. And every chapter we've gone through, I don't think there's one that doesn't have a theme of education within just the each chapter itself. Like here it comes up again, even though it's just, it's constant. And it's interesting because it doesn't take too much digging to get that. You know, we're not, I'm, no, you, you, you yeah. are definitely a scholar. I am not some like, you know, uh, academia that's like, well, I've studied this for many layers. I mean, you read it once through and you, you, you should know that, that it's pretty much that's what's about, but. And so, and this doesn't really, this is a, there is a tilt and there is, um, I mean, they, they do use spears and they do, and the, the thing is, though, they get into a bickering match. Uh, Pelinor and Grummerson get into a bickering match about, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. I did not. Yes, you, no, you did. Yes, I did not. You know, it was you. You did that. And so it ends up in a schoolyard fight. And the two of them accidentally knock each other out. And like White and, and Merlin says, don't worry. They'll be the best of friends when they both come to. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even though it's about... Uh, tilting jousting fencing it's also just about the way humans human it's just it's it, it's about two guys it, you know it's like two men fighting over a bowling game i mean it's just you didn't it's big lebowski you know, <laughs> counting to zero you know, it's, in fact if you watch big lebowski while you're watching reading this chapter for the bowling scenes uh, you you will find that I, I don't know I, I doubt there's any influence uh, to the Cohen brothers, but uh, you you will see much of the same dialogue and right the similarity yeah. between the banter. I yeah. never would have pointed that out. I never would have made that yeah. connection. It's been a long time since I've seen that film, but but I've been yeah. rereading this book for a while now, and it's it gets more visual. And unfortunately, I still, or maybe fortunately, I still have imagery, of course, from the Disney film in my head because that was one of my first exposures. And so it's hard for me not to see those characters when it comes to bantering. Like I want to kind of come up and have like a different imagery, like. I, that's something I wanted to talk to you about as well. Like if there are films that you've liked that have done sword on the stone takes or TV shows. And cause there's been so many, and I have to admit, I gravitate towards all of them because I, I love the theme yeah. so much. I, I only think there's really one good Arthur movie. And that's the truth. I, uh, people ask me if I watch like Merlin, it's a sci-fi show. Yes. <laughs> there was an earlier one. I love it. it. <laughs> I think it was Sam Grant, the guy from Jurassic Park, was Merlin in another series. Okay. And, um, Camelot is terrible. The movie is terrible. 
instead of going, you know, they use Richard Harris instead of Richard Burton. That was a mistake. God only knows. I don't even remember who the Julianne. So instead of Robert Goulet, Julie Andrews, and Richard Burton, oh, the guy, the French guy who sings If Ever I Would Leave You, it's terrible. It's just, <laughs> it's not as bad as Peter O'Toole's Man of La Mancha, but which is a high, a high standard for bad singing. <laughs> um, the only movie I've ever liked, Arthurian, is Excalibur. Excalibur, um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, Patrick Stewart is the father of uh, Guinevere, mm-hmm. and he is magnificent. Uh, they use the movie from Carl Orff's. Uh, oh, oh, come on now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <sighs> uh, o Fortuna. Come on, what's the name of the Carmina Burana? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carmina Burana, the his great uh, operatic. Okay, the it is. opera, yeah, yeah. Um, and what's great about the song "O oh, Fortuna"? It mm-hmm. is the wheel of fortune, and the singers are saying, "If you stay in the center, you're fine." But when you hear it, you're like, "So, um, yeah." I, I've always thought Excalibur w- was the, the probably the only Arthurian movie that mm-hmm. I didn't want to strangle anybody at. Right. Uh, <laughs> The Disney, the Sword in the Stone, I thought um, is not good, and it, the the reviewers in 1963 said the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's three. The uh, Arthur has three different voices. There's that idiotic scene with the squirrels that just the doesn't. The squirrels is a pretty bad one. Yeah, but I as a doesn't. child, I have to say I really liked it. Oh like, yeah, you don't know better then. But now you you look back and it's disappointing. Yeah. I think you know too much. That's the problem when you know too much. Yeah, and the wolf, the whole wolf thing uh, is just, it's its not, I mean, it's great. Oh, it's scary. There's a wolf in the story, but it's its overdone. Uh, the whole, yeah. and I guess they are bringing out a new one on the life of Madame Mim. Now. Oh, that, that, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a live action about Madame Mim's life, you know, mm. and in my review of the stories, when you get there, you'll see I, I really went into some depth about where she might have gone to school and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the reason Arthurian uh, books don't work well, uh, movies don't work well, I'm sorry, it's kind of the same reason um, Robin Hood stories, um, there was a TV show from the BBC when I was young, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding <laughs> through the glen. The Errol Flynn version and the Bugs Bunny version are all so good yeah. that when everyone tries to make a reboot of it, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Mel Brooks, uh, Brooks has his. Oh, yeah. Bandits, the Men in Tights. <laughs> which is just pretty good. And then you got um, Time Bandits has Robin Hood, which is funny. Oh, man. But the Kevin Costner one and the, the other guy who was in uh, Gladiator one, uh, R- Russell, uh, Russell Crowe. Crow. You, you just watch him. It's like, ugh. Yeah, I didn't even watch that one. <laughs> the story, the stories become very labored, and um, because it was done. And oh, the uh, by the way, speaking of Patrick Stewart, um, Star Trek: The Next Generation's um, Robin Hood one is actually not bad. Oh, uh, when you compare it to some of these horrid movies that have come out. <laughs> but the Bugs Bunny one, I will go to my death as the Porky Pig as Friar Tuck is just <laughs> perfect casting. Bugs Bunny. <laughs> It's ge- yeah, yeah, it's genius. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I've, I've been meaning to ask you all this time because we never really talk about the films because we're so engrossed in the book. But mm-hmm. it's funny because I knew you were going to, I knew Excalibur was going to be the only one that maybe passed for you because I was like, you do, you know too much. <laughs> yeah. And when you know and, too much, that's the problem. Yeah. And and the nice thing about, I don't know who the actor is I, I in uh, Excalibur who plays Arthur um because he's not famous and i thought that was a good choice mm. you know if you have uh, you know matt damon playing young king arthur um it, it's probably better to have a lesser known person yeah as the as the uh, just, i agree you know and I'm, I'm my knowledge of movie making is uh nil but uh, <laughs> i i am opinion i have strong opinions about everything but, yeah <laughs> 
but the sword and the stone you can have really strong opinions on i mean Very i think strong. i think wow I, you've really done your 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 due study and research so i think that that one you're you're very entitled at this point for this you've earned it you. uh, you've earned it uh one of the things in this chapter that made me kind of laugh because of merlin's like grumpy curmudgeon -y way he he gets like very spiteful and so i like when he said that um I don't remember what it was that Sir Ector did, but Merlin was really furious, so he gave him two nights of uh, rheumatism. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and what was it that Sir Ector did? Let me look that up because it's just too funny. But um, I guess it was the bill getting. Oh, I guess it was just the the that was he was having the games he was having more tilting games and so merlin was frustrated with that and so i think that's because i feel like a bit of a merlin all the time where i'm trying to be kind instead of right and i'm trying not to be spiteful or lash out on some of the the madness that's been going on and i just i'm trying to take what's considered the high road but it doesn't feel good all the time like i feel like i want to be like merlin where i'm like i would like to give someone rheumatism or more than that for two nights and i may but then it makes me feel like that's not the right thing to do <laughs> but i kind of want to be merlin so one of the other things about this uh, particular scene and, and i hope you don't miss it is that uh, wart arthur is crying because once again he wants to be a knight Mm -hmm. he's going to call himself the black knight i think yes and, the black knight i highlighted that and he'll um and okay i have a quote here uh, merlin says your wife will scarcely enjoy the life and then uh, arthur oh i'm not going to have a wife i think they are They're stupid, stupid. <laughs> i shall have a lady love though uh, so i can wear her favor in my helm and do deeds in her honor and then things get a little quiet don't forget it's almost the next story i think is when we go off into the forest and we meet robin wood and when he meets when arthur meets maid marion mm -hmm. his views on women changes radically very radically yes and so it's kind of a fun little thing to to see it because you know god i'd like to sit down with little danny john who's about 12 13 and listen <laughs> to what and the funny thing is and i gotta say this he was right about a lot of stuff. He he got, I think uh, in a recent uh, Instagram post, I talked about a thing I found. When he was 14, he wrote in his journal, which is right behind me, mm -hmm. that when he's my age, 50 years from now, he would like to do squat snatches and presses, overhead presses to keep himself young and healthy. Oh. <laughs> and so I did a little, little Instagram on it because he's exactly right squat snatches and clean and press keep me young and healthy absolutely and little shit got it right you know, <laughs> uh, you know 1971 you know he got it right i love it we have to celebrate those wins <laughs> yeah. and i and I'll, I'll look at my journal sometime and there'll be little hints about the future and worries about mm -hmm. things and you know i have a famous thing about will i ever get married because you know i'm not dating anybody in fact it even came up today at uh you know, breakfast. Do you mind me just talking? No, I them? love it. Let's, <laughs> we keep going. And uh, Erica and Mike and I were at breakfast after our workout. It was just the three of us today, very, very small, small session. And Erica talked about having, you know, a perm and bangs in her prom picture and this beautiful dress. And Mike went to Olympus's prom and um, Sky Skyline's prom. And then they both looked at me and they said, what about prom? And I said, I didn't go to prom. And then we just left it dry. Well, the reason I didn't go to prom was we were poor and I couldn't afford it. I had no money. And so I made this little decision that uh, maybe I'll go to prom now, but one day, and today's that day, you know, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have money and I'll be able to send my kids to prom. And, you know, I was able to pay for, so my kids went to Catholic schools because I live here in Utah. So I picked up all their education, including their master's degrees. Wow. because that's and they never and i maybe spoiled them a little bit but uh <laughs> it's it's funny to think about when you when you read this section here on arthur um oh my god i i honestly i am making this whole thing a little bit too personal but that's the sign to me of a great book is i just reread that section right there 
on him getting a wife um, and the, his he knows he's not going to have his goals it, by the way he's right he will never mm -hmm. be a knight because he goes right from knight to king mm -hmm. you know and the old the old the old anglo-saxon spellings are coming back in my head as i explain this all to you <laughs> um, but the, it's interesting that it would be well worth your time uh you parents if you have a 12 or 13 year old to sit down with a tape recorder and a video and talk about their future and video it and then you know and then every 20 years you know this is what you thought at 13 and you were right about all this and you were wrong about this but not by much in the same way i think you should sit down my, my sister has been sending me um pictures and stories that mm -hmm. i never knew my mom died 41 years ago my dad always called her precious and i didn't i thought that was his nickname for her. what i didn't know was that was my mom's nickname Mm. when she played uh, basketball in the old style but uh female basketball was uh, just a different style for saint paul's um her brother my uncle joe would sit in the stands and say pass the ball precious shoot the ball precious <laughs> and the opposing teams would make fun of her calling her precious but my mom's nickname was precious you know Aww. when i found that out when i was 64 years old oh, wow <laughs> And so what happens sometimes in families is, is that you use these beautiful, you lose these beautiful stories. And that's why I think what you did for your father is so uh, lovely for our listeners who are new. Uh, Mimi did a wonderful documentary on her dad, uh, which I uh, might, you know, what you're going to do Mimi, you're going to have well, your dad's you. documentary and Tommy Kono's one of his documentaries. And you're going to share those today. <laughs> I shall. As, and no, because, you know, when we're talking about Asian Americans, mm -hmm. um, your dad was from not, not, what part of China? Uh, Southern China from the, the uh, Shenzhen area. Okay. So from the Southern China. Southern China. Mm -hmm. Southern China. And Tommy is, a, you know, a, a Japanese American. Mm -hmm. And their stories have so many parallels. And in both cases, uh, athletics or sports of some kind is part of what makes them more American than the bulk of the people I deal with who would attack a, 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 more American than a person <laughs> who would attack an Asian American, mm -hmm. much more American. So yeah, it's, it's, it's your, 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 the documentary is a beautiful story Thank and you. the Tommy Kono, Kono stuff. Um, it'll make you wonder why you don't know Tommy Kono. Yeah. Yeah. No, I am. I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm absolutely going to share those links and yeah. thank you for that. And, and I, this is, this is why I podcast this because I really like to have these conversations and I'm fortunate to be able to have them with guests yeah. like you and have friendship through this, but it's, it's funny that you say that this is a sign of a great book, because I think we all kind of start to reflect our lives through their experiences and feel those parallels. And, um, you I find myself doing the same. Well, I just told you, I thought I was Merlin. I feel like I'm Merlin. <laughs> and, and I know you've said it different times in your lives, you're, you're different characters through this book. And yeah, I think that's sometimes Merlin and sometimes I'm Ward. Yeah. And yeah. Sometimes I'm K. I always think of my brother, Phil as K. Yes. Yes. I, I love that. Battling away with them and little bastard dies. Um, <laughs> but the sign of a great book folks. And, and I do think this is that in our simple conversation, uh, while you were talking, I just pressed it open and it popped right up to that little part to your wife will scarcely enjoy the life. And then and it, it tied me into uh, Maid Marian and then mm -hmm. it tied me, you know, and it then tied me into my story about being 14. It tied me. And that's when, whenever, and, and this can happen too. You can be in, in an art exhibit and just kind of glance up and go, wow. And when you sometimes in life, you know, you, it's hard sometimes. It's like when you try to tell some, the funniest, uh, uh, God, my high school female athletes, I want to kill them all. Funniest <laughs> thing ever. But sometimes you try to tell somebody a story about something funny that happened. Mm -hmm. And about halfway through the story, you realize it kind of had to be there. <laughs> well, Sometimes like with, when you see great art or you hear something, you listen to some music that is just absolutely transcendent. And then someone will say, well, what's going on? And you'd be like, and then when you try to use words, 
words, words, words, Hamlet. Uh, you just, you flounder and you just can't. And that's to me is what a great book is, is when they use words to leap you into a different world. In the same way the artist's pen, the artist's paintbrush, the musician's instrument or voice, an instrument, I guess, um, can transcend everything. And that's what gets, that's what I think is life's beauty. Um, you know, Leo's now starting to smile and actually laugh. And to get a baby to laugh, you know, I, I videotape it to send to my sister and, mm -hmm. and some of my friends uh, no, I, on my phone, whatever you call it, video. It. And uh, watching a baby laugh is just like one of those moments where you just can't not, I can't not smile <laughs> when I hear a baby laughing uncontrolled because you're, you're doing this to the nose. That's all you're doing is doing this to the nose. But to the baby, it's the funniest thing that's ever happened. It's true <laughs> in their life. Yes, yes. And that to me, is, so to me, when people ask me what a great book is, it's a, gr a great book has those moments that you come back to over and you've read the book 100, 200 times. And then you find this thing and then your brain goes to these far corners of the universe. That's a great book, a mm -hmm. great art, great whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great piece of work for sure. I, I love the fact that you still have your journals from when you were 14. <laughs> I mean, that is amazing. It's a lot easier for this generation because they can type it and keep it on a hard drive and it's stored. So listeners, absolutely, you should be journaling and, and have uh, well, your kids journaling. What year, what year you can't were really you lose it. <laughs> 17, Maybe what year were you 17, 1978. <laughs> what year again 1978 uh what day january 31st for our listeners let's, listening dan is flipping through some notebook right now doing the day you were born <laughs> oh this is too much fun oh darn it uh it would be the very next journal but which is buried in there oh, that's okay it. Uh, I can tell you what I was doing when you were conceived. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I love it. That is too crazy though, that you, have you always kept like your records of everything that is just your nature or, um, well, yeah, as best I can. Yeah. Um, well, this one here and grab it. Yeah, so this one here, this is my first one. Wow. That's Phil Grapaldi, who is my Sp hero. Spiral notebook. Yeah, and then here's here's uh, Dave Cheney, a football player I wanted to be like, and here's Gary Ordway, inclining. And here's my little one of my first little graphs about how to learn how to, if I can do, uh, keep set. Yeah, I see it. Uh-huh. Squat, bench, press. <laughs> if it's a whole body workout or not. So... <laughs> Oh, I, this isn't my first one, but it's close. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I have a note here from March 3rd, 1978, because I forgot some information. Oh, okay. And a few years later, I added it. On March 25th, 1972, on the incline bench press with 65 pounds, I did eight, a set of eight and a set of four. And the bench press with 65 pounds, I did a set of eight, six, four. I squatted 65 pounds, 10, 10, 10. Oh no, and my left elbow barked a little bit, so I applied fast heating minute rub to it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Not just do you keep the journal, but you're a very good journaler. So <laughs> well, not very. It's just uh yeah. So what one of the things that helps me with a lot is when I am working with uh someone, uh it it humilifies me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it uh when i'm going god what the hell why did you yeah that's 65 pounds i ended up that year benching 100 the next year i benched two the next year i benched three and you wouldn't believe me where i went from there but uh yeah i i can go back and look at these workouts and say yeah i did that yeah i overcame you know there's a lot of issues going on in my life in 72 um so by this time, let's see, 72, 
Phil would be going to Korea and then Nam right after that. Uh, two two brothers at home who were uh, disabled by the war. Uh, my dad was starting to drink really heavy then. You know, there's a lot of crap going on. Mm -hmm. But by reading that journal, you know, I get my head back into that time and, and get a toolkit for how I overcame it in 72 and it this and this and this worked that and that and that didn't and that's that's why I think there's real value in having journals mm -hmm. uh, long term mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And wow. especially as a strength coach or a throws coach uh, it takes me back to the process so if I am working with a 120 pound high school freshman who has big aspirations I'm talking about a boy I can say yeah I was 118 as a freshman and mm -hmm. this is what I did this was my, this is my journey. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of your yourself oh, yeah. with me, but also with all the listeners and we, we made it through chapter seven today. So. Okay. And next time, uh, do me a favor next time and tell me what chapter you're working on. And okay. I will make sure I, I do a little extra homework, but oh my gosh, no, you don't need to do extra homework. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's going to make me feel like I need to do extra, extra homework. Yeah, I'm kind of expecting that. <laughs> Mimi is always here at the light. And oh, I'll you're a delight. You very soon, okay? Yes, thank you so much. Great to see you. Talk soon and good luck. And, um, you know, don't let the assholes get you down. Uh, keep, keep doing the work. Um, as <laughs> there was this great, great singing group called the Weavers and something very bad happened in America. And the, the, the lead singer um, uh, of the Weaver is not, he, he's not the most famous, Pete Seeger is the most famous. And he famously said, this too shall pass. So. Yes. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Right. Until next time, Dan. Until next time. Bye-bye now. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.